going through seven churches of Revelation, and, and you can find these in Revelation chapter 2. And uh, the, the uh, third church that we're going to talk about today is the church of Pergamos, the church of Pergamos. And uh, we see in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, that uh, Jesus addresses this church. And I, I want to just say, a lot of times people read um, the text in Revelation chapter 2 as God is really hot and angry at all these churches and it's uh, just very uh, judgmental. And that's not a, a right reading of this. He, he's approaching them with grace. He's approaching them with love. And what I love about, as you read through some of these, these churches, no matter how uh, many problems they have and dysfunction they have, he still calls them a church. And you know what that tells me? That there's hope for our church. There's hope for me. That when, when God comes to us with his word, with correction, he's trying to help us. Does anybody want to be helped? I don't know about you. I need all the help I can get. And so Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, the word of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. And what we have to know in the context here is that Pergamus uh, was known as the city of the sword. It was an a execution center of the Roman Empire in this part of the world. And uh, as twisted as it sounds, they took a lot of pride in that. That they, they were a, a place that uh, was, was where Roman authority was centered. And we've talked about how there was this cult worship of Rome going on in each one of these seven uh, cities. And uh, Jesus takes their point of pride. And he does this in every one of these churches, every one of these cities where they have a point of pride. He takes that point of pride and applies it to himself. And so he tells this church, he says, I'm the one that has a two-edged sword in my mouth. Well, what does that mean? Well, we see this all throughout the book of Revelation. In Revelation 1.16, it says, In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a what? A two-edged sword. Revelation 19, when things are wrapping up with the culmination of, of human history, it says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And, and here's what you need to know when it talks about Jesus having a sharp two-edged sword in his mouth, it's talking about his place of judgment. And we're gonna come back to that here in a few minutes. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So here's their uh, commendation. We, you've uh, talked about every one of these church have a commendation, what they're doing right. And theirs is this, they held on to the name of Jesus and they held on to their faith. In Revelation 2.13, it says, I know where you dwell. I know where you're at. I know that the pressures that you're facing that are around you, where Satan's throne is. And so he's saying, you are right where hell has a demonic foothold. Yet you hold fast to my name and you do not deny the faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So it, it appears that there was a, a man in the church who was martyred for his faith. And, and Jesus says, I know where you're at. I know you are right in the middle of where hell resides, where Satan's throne is. And uh, this may be referring to that not only was the Roman cult worshiped in Pergamos, but there was a, a huge uh, Greek temple to Greek gods. Uh, any idol that you could worship could almost be found in Pergamos. And, and so he, he may be saying that uh, not only are you fighting one uh, adversary, you're fighting many adversaries because there was so much idolatry that was there. But I, I got to thinking about, you know, what does that mean where Satan's throne is? Well, at the heart of, of Satan is this, and at the heart of idolatry is this, pride. It, it is a satanic trait that you will find at the heart of any idol, of any 
idolatry, of any idol worshipers, pride. And so the first point I want to give us today is this. Satan's throne is found wherever pride is. And pride seeks to elevate me, seeks to elevate uh, man's systems above God. Here's probably the, the most churchy way we say it. It's the world. It's the world's systems. It's the world's way of thinking. And, and it, it is a, at the heart of Satan because that's how he got to where he is. And in Isaiah 14, we see that the prophet Isaiah uh, is speaking prophetically and he's speaking to a human king. But most biblical scholars believe that this human king represents Satan. And he, it says this in Isaiah 14, how are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? How you are cut down to the ground who laid the nations low. In other words, you've deceived the nations, but you've been cut down and you're fallen. And I just want to stop here. Pride comes before what? A fall. You're coming down. You're going down. The, the, the best way to go up is to lower yourself before God has to do it. Because he will do it. And, and you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will uh, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. In other words, what, what is he saying? I'm gonna lift myself higher than God. I deserve a place alongside or higher than God. But you are brought down to Sheol. And that simply means hell. To the far reaches of the pit. And we see that this is what pride does to people. They try to puff themselves up. They try to, to lift themselves up above God and above other people. And it actually brings their destruction. And I, as we read those scriptures, did anyone notice how many times the word I is used? And that's what a prideful person will do. That's what a prideful system will do. It will elevate man at the expense of God. And, and here's how you defeat pride as you become like Jesus, Amen. who lowered himself, even though he was God, lowered himself to our level. And, and when you read the prayer of Jesus, when you read what we call the Lord's Prayer, it's not a uh, prayer of I's and me's, it's a prayer of you and yours. Yeah. Yeah. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And if you want to empty yourself of pride, be all about other people and God. Come on, does anybody want that in your life? Anybody want to rid yourself of pride? And if you're here today and you're like, well, I don't struggle with that. Well, that is a really good sign that you struggle with that. Years ago, there's a, we had a testimony service yeah, you know, like one of those Thanksgiving testimony service. And, and uh, somebody got up and said, everybody knows I'm the most humble person here. <laughs> but prideful people hate for other people to tell them what to do. The anthem of a prideful person is this. It, it's the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. I'm not gonna let you correct me. I'm not going to let you tell me I'm wrong. I, I'm going to lift my opinion above yours. I'm going to lift my ways of doing life above yours. And, and that is the way of the world. And that's at the heart of idolatry is this. I don't care what God says. I don't care who God thinks he is. I'm going to do it my way. And, and here's what you need to know. God hates pride. If you want to turn God off in your life, become prideful. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble. You know what it means to, to be humble? It means to lower yourself. Amen. To, even though you're, you're maybe the smartest person in the room, 
You don't present yourself that way. Maybe you're the most powerful person in the room. You don't present yourself that way. A humble person rids themselves of pride. And so that's why we're fasting right now. You know what fasting's all about? Ridding myself of pride, humbling myself, saying, God, I need you. God, I'm dependent upon you. God, I can't do it on my own. And, and here's what we need to do is that we need to uh, fill our life with humility in this, this hour. And, and, and here's what that looks like. God, your opinion above, above mine, your way above mine, your word above my opinion. Lord, I'm submitting my life to you. And that's how we rid ourselves of Satan's throne in our life. And, and a good way to, for Satan to enthrone, to allow him to enthrone himself in your life is to puff yourself up. Make yourself look big. You, you know, there's people that when, when they walk in the room, they always gotta be the center of attention and they don't care if it's for good or bad as long as they get the attention. You know what that is? That's pride. You, you, know, you know what uh, a, a, a prideful attitude says? I don't need to pray and fast. I, I don't need to do anything. No, no, no you, we need to humble ourselves in this hour. How many knows if we've ever been at the mercy and the need of the grace of God, it's right now. And, and now's not the time to get prideful. Now's not the time to get prideful about how long we've been serving God. Now's not the time to get prideful about all the past years we fasted or how much we've read the word. Right now's the time to be hungry and to be humble for God to use us and for God to purify us. Can we lift up our hands right now over this place and say, God, use me, humble me, amen. Revelation 2.15, but we see that they, they also have some correction. In Revelation 2.15, it says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there, everybody say some there. It's not everybody. Who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual Immorality. So the correction that they receive is this. They tolerated false teaching and practices. And he says that the, the false teaching that they have tolerated is the teaching of Balaam. Now, who's Balaam? Balaam was an Old Testament character who, when the children of Israel were passing through the wilderness, a king of Moab hired him to prophesy against Israel. So that's, that's kind of the first tip off about his character. He was hired to prophesy. And when he tried to prophesy against the children of Israel, he couldn't do it. God would not allow him. And uh, eventually, the way he got them to fall into sin was this, is that he lured them. He advised the king of Moab to send out the women of Moab, and they lured the children of Israel into sexual immorality. So the teaching of Balaam isn't a, a specific set of doctrines, if you will, but it's more an attitude. It's a deceitful, defiant spirit that compromises truth for the sake of gain. And then the second thing I wanna tell us today is don't compromise your identity. Don't compromise your identity. And pride is at the heart of compromise. All these work together. You see, Pride says, I'm gonna do it my way. Pride says, if I can gain something at the expense of sacrificing truth, I'm going to do it to exalt myself. And the compromise that some of the church of Pergamum were committing was that they were eating at parties where it was uh, meat that was dedicated and, and sacrificed to idols were being served at these parties. Now, what was the big deal about that? Well, what they were doing was they were identifying with that idol worship. And so maybe they were in a trade guild, maybe they were in a, some part of a business or whatever, and if you wanted to be in, you had to go to this party and you had to eat of this meat. And it reminds us of the Hebrew boys, right? Daniel and the, 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 the Hebrew boys who, who drew the line and they said, we'll let you change our names, but we're not going to let you dictate what we eat. 
We're not going to compromise that part of our identity. And so the direct threat against the church of Pergamum had failed. That was persecution. But it was being destroyed from within. How many knows that, that sometimes the church can be its own worst enemy? And if we're not careful, we'll let things like compromise come and, and get a foothold in the church. And so this group in the church that was going to these parties, they were dabbling with the world and dabbling with Jesus too. They were showing up to church on Sunday and then Friday night they were going to this party where this idol was being worshiped through the eating of meat and so forth. And here's what we need to know is that you cannot dabble with Jesus and dabble with the world too. It's idolatry. James 4.4 4 says, do you not know the friendship with the world is what enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself what? The enemy of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't be friends with people who aren't Christians. That's not what that's saying. When he talks about friendship with the world, it's about the world's way of doing things. Let's talk about the world's systems. And I just want to put a free public announcement, a free PA out there. There's a lot of churches where you can show up on Sunday morning and, and uh, do all the stuff. And then when you walk out of the door, there's no expectations. Uh, there's very low expectations if they do exist. And you can do whatever you want to Monday through Saturday. I want to tell you, this ain't one of them. Right. That when you... When you come into the church of the living God, when God delivers you out of the world, you're to leave that system behind. You're to leave that way of thinking behind. How many knows that the world has nothing to offer the church? We become friends with the world by imitating their way of life. We become friends with the world when there's no difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, that's how we know that we're friends with the world. And you can't satisfy Jesus and the world at the same time. You gotta pick. You gotta pick a team and fight. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. And, and you gotta be like, like uh, the angel told Job and his family, when you leave this place, don't you turn around. Don't you look back. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. She turned around to get one more last glimpse of the world and turned into a pillar of salt. And I'm not preaching perfectionism right now. I'm not saying that you're, you're always gonna get it right. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying your orientation is towards Jesus and not the world. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Anybody got your mind made up? Anybody want to serve God with all your heart? So when God calls us into his family, we are to renounce the old way of living and the associations that come with it. And sometimes that's costly. And the reason why some of the people in Pergamus, Pergamum were, were struggling with this. Was It was their job, go to the party and keep your job or don't show up and get shunned. And then Paul quotes the Old Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, therefore, come out from among them. Yeah, What's that talking about? Come out of the world. Right. Come out of the world's way of doing things. Now, I almost want to stop here. The world... A lot of us, our mind immediately goes to things like, you know, don't go to theaters, don't go to this, 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 this. The world's a whole lot more than that. The, the, the world can be the political system. Uh, the, the world can be the entertainment systems. The world can be, uh, the world is established in your high school that pulls you, that says, come be with us. Come do this. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be involved. In, you don't have to associate with yourself with church. It's constantly pulling each and every one of us, and it's sneaky. For some of us, it's materialism. Yeah, watch out. Constantly buying things. You know what that is? That's the world. 
It's the love of the world. It's a love for the order that's in place now in place of the order that's coming, and that's the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. So he says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean, and I will what? Receive you. How many wants the Lord to receive you? And so God is jealous for our love. He's jealous for our attention. And so when he saw this section of the church going to these parties, he doesn't say, well, it's only a few of them. No, he addresses it. Why? Because he loves them. He's jealous for every part of them. God isn't happy with 99.9%. He wants 100. And, and here's how it works. If, if they tolerate this group, it's going to grow. And it's going to infect the church. And they're going to lose their identity. And here's what an idol is. It's anything outside of God that gives me meaning. You know that, that worldliness can be an unhealthy infatuation with your boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, mom, dad, house, people around you, job. Anything in my life that gives me meaning outside of Jesus Christ is an idol. Anything that makes me say, if I lose that, I can't be happy is an idol. And I don't know about you, but I, I found that Jesus meets all of my needs. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was good. He was good 10 years ago. He was enough 10 years ago. He's enough today. No matter what state I am, Jesus is enough. If today you're single, Jesus is enough. If you're divorced, Jesus is enough. If you're struggling, Jesus is enough. And here's what the world wants to convince us. If you're not madly in love with somebody, you have to be miserable. You know why? Because to the world, love is an idol. The world says if, if you're struggling financially, there's no way you can be happy. That's an idol. And we have to come back. That's what, what he said to the first church, your first love. Where every time we stepped into these doors... It was joy unspeakable, full of glory. Why? Because we had found what we were looking for. Come on, some, somebody, somebody just search your heart right now and say, God, rid me of the idols. Idols can be good things. I love Danielle, but she can't give me meaning. I love my kids, but they can't give me meaning. I love this job, but it can't give me meaning. And here's how you know you don't have an idol in your life. When every part of you has been stripped away and you can still say he's enough. Yeah. Amen. Third thing, don't compromise your purity. Don't compromise your purity. The second component of the teaching of Balaam was sexual immorality. So there's two component, components. The first was eating meat that was associated with idol worship, and the second was sexual immorality. And I want you to see that there's a, a, a trend that happens here. Pride leads to compromise, which almost always leads to sexual immorality. And, and it's so many uh, idols that Israel worshiped when they backslid away from God. At the heart of that idolatry was the practice of sexual immorality. And so it was common at these parties that the, the church of Pergamum, that some of them were going to, they would eat this meat. And then there, there were uh, these temple prostitutes would come in to the party and they were expected to participate in that. So you, you see how that, that compromise would happen. Right. Maybe they say, well, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to show up. I might not even eat. I'm just gonna have a Coke. 
Like the drink, not. <laughs> so they get to the party and it's like, oh man, that steak looks good. And it's just steak, right? I mean, who doesn't enjoy a good Ruth's Chris? And so they, they start to eat and it's a slow fade. Their defenses are lowered and in comes the rest of the crew. And before you know it, they've fallen into sexual immorality. So the Bible <clears throat> persistently depicts sexual sin as idolatry. Paul says in Colossians 3, 5, put to death. Just stop there for a minute. Don't tolerate it. Don't allow room for it. No hint of it. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. At the heart of that, and, and I think that would cover not just you know, sexual acts, but pornography, covetousness, fantasizing about things I shouldn't be thinking about. It's idolatry. And here's why. Sexual sin is, goes beyond physical acts, that there is a spiritual component to it. Yes, sexual activity uses for idolatry what God has given us for good. Right. And by the way, the same is true. When used for good, there is a special, uh, there is a spiritual connection that takes place, which is why God gave us that gift to stay within biblical marriage of one man, one woman. That you spiritually become connected with a person through that gift that God gave us. And the reason that God takes this sin so seriously is that it's a sin against our body. You see, when Jesus paid the price for us. When we repented of our sins and when we baptized that body in water and then he filled us with his spirit, there's a dirty little secret that we don't always tell you and that is it ain't yours anymore. You're God's. And when I sin sexually, I'm taking Jesus with me. And I'm taking what's sacred, what's been paid for by the blood of the lamb, and I'm entering into an idolatrous place. If somebody came in here today and started spraying graffiti all over these walls, I hope somebody would tackle them. And I would look the other way if you socked them a couple times. You know why? Because, because these, these walls represent sacrifice. This is where we encounter God's presence together. It's not an ordinary place. But, but here's what we do when we sin sexually. We do the same thing. We defame the temple of God. And, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul talks about this. And he says, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from, what's that mean? Run like Joseph. Don't go to the party. I'm, I'm gonna go here. Don't go on the date. Don't be alone in that situation. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against what? His own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. I'm, I'm just gonna stop here and I've, I've talked to several people and say, well, it's my body. I'll do what I want to with it. I'll dress the way I want to. No, it's not. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on, is anybody with me today? And so when we, we, when we teach against this, it's not just, oh, we wanna ruin everybody's fun. No, 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 we want you to experience the great gift God has for you. 
in a biblical way. And when we step outside of that, we are committing idolatry with our body and we sin against us. He says, you're not your own for you're bought with a price. You're not like everybody else in your high school. You're not like everybody else at work. I've been bought with a price, so I'm going to, what, glorify God in my body. Does anybody want to glorify God? Come on, that's what this generation needs to hear. And I'm going to say it again, you, you can't just... Do what you want to do Monday through Saturday and come in here and expect to feel the presence of God. You know why? Because you're the temple. When you defile the temple, God takes it seriously. So here we find the command. Romans, uh, Revelation 2, 16, he says, Therefore, repent. Turn around. Stop walking towards the world. Start walking towards God. That's what it means. Repent. Everybody say repent. repent. And I just want to tell you that, that that is one of the greatest words that you will ever hear in your life. If you're here today and you're struggling with this area of your life, maybe you've compromised, maybe that you have fallen into to the trap of sexual immorality, here's the good news. Repent. Repent. And God can wash us whiter than snow. God is a God of second chances. How many here can testify of that, that, that God has forgiven, God has restored? Amen. I know people that live the lifestyle of, of fornication who are happily married, and God has restored that gift to them in marriage, and God can do that for you too. But you gotta repent. Turn back to me. If not, I will come to you soon. Remember we talked about the sword in his mouth and he said, and war against them. Notice he didn't say you, he said them. With the sword of my mouth. Now this is, this is heavy, all right? I'm just gonna warn you, this, this is heavy. In Old Testament Israel, whenever there was sin in the camp, God dealt with it. And sometimes he thinned the herd. Now, we have to be careful because we live in the dispensation of grace, the era of grace. However, God still judges sin within the church. And I've gotta take this seriously because my sin does affect you. You don't believe me? By the time I'd walk you through two, two phone calls I've had to deal with this week where sexual sin almost destroyed two entire churches. And so Jesus says, repent, or I'm gonna come to you with a sword in my mouth, which is what? Judgment. Where does it say elsewhere in the, in the word of God? Judgment begins where? House of God. Do you know that? That, that, that judgment doesn't begin in Hollywood. You know what? God doesn't expect that. But those of us who claim to be Christians, he's watching us. But here's the good news. Here's the promise. Each one of these churches receive a promise. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. First of all, I just want to stop there and I want to say, what's God saying to you through this sermon today? Do you have an ear for what God's hearing? Is it just white noise or is it alive in your soul? To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna. What's the hidden manna? Well, in the Old Testament, when Israel was hungry, God provided this supernatural form of substance called manna. It was like a flower-like substance that would appear on the ground each day. And it represents 
the word of God. It represents the provision of God. And here's what I think God is saying to those who don't compromise themselves, who don't fall into the trap of sin, I'm gonna show them supernatural things. I'm gonna show them supernatural things about me. Those who wanna grow closer will grow closer. Does anybody here wanna grow closer? Anybody want some of that hidden manna? Here's a, y'all know I like to eat. And I, I know that this might be here, uh, hard to hear while you're fasting, but how, does anybody ever been to those restaurants where they have off menu things, like you've had it and they take it off the menu and you call them out and you're like, hey, you used to have this, where'd it go? And the waiter's like, well, I could talk to the manager and see what we can do. And you know, like <laughs> the manager knows who you are, he's like, well, we'll make it for you. You know what, that's hidden manna. Right, yeah. We don't serve this to everybody, but you eat here all the time, I'll make it. That's what God does for people who refuse to compromise, who refuse to give up themselves. He said, I'm gonna show you things about myself that's, come on, does anybody want God to show you some supernatural things in 2022? Amen. Some hidden manna. Your home, just go home and feast on that this week. And pray at the end of this fast, God, I want some hidden manna. I want you to give me some supernatural revelation. And he says, I will give you a white stone. What was a white stone? Well, white stone was a sort of like a ticket into events at this time. And so God says, I'm, I'm gonna give you a white stone. How many is living for heaven here today? I wanna hear, welcome home, good and faithful servant. That's my ticket. I'm not giving up my ticket. You can't have my ticket. With a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. God has a new name for you. We see this in the Bible that Jacob goes to Israel. Saul becomes Paul. God changes people's names and gives them a new God-given identity. And, and I don't know what that name is, but God has a personal new name for you if you are faithful. And there's mystery to that, which makes it all the more wonderful. Wouldn't that be awesome to hear a personalized name that God has just for you. Amen. And we can have that. If we just remain faithful and stay in the love of God. Can we all stand right now? Oh, yeah. Amen. Why don't we lift up our hands all over this place right now? Why don't we just pray, God, rid me of any pride in my life. Lord, any area of my life, God, Lord, where I'm puffed up. Lord, I pray, God, that we wouldn't compromise our identity, God. I pray, Lord, that we would have the wherewithal, God, of those Hebrew boys. Say, do with us what you want to, but we're not eating the king's meat. God, I pray we would stay pure, Lord. Lord, in an era, God, where pornography is easily accessible, where unfaithfulness is tolerated and even encouraged. Lord, I pray we would walk out of here as temples of the Holy Ghost, God. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Come on, anybody feel that here today? That's God's love. That's God's love. And I just want to encourage, we got too much to live for to quit now. We got too much to look forward to, to quit now. So if you've, you've compromised some areas of your life, repent. That's the word of the Lord today, repent. If you've gone some areas where you don't need to go, repent. Why? Because God's coming for a holy church. God's coming for a holy people. That's what we're living for. Hallelujah. I just want to pray. 
Right now, Lord, I pray anybody here today, God, needs to surrender their life to you. I pray they do that today, God. Anybody here that's not, Lord, taking the step to be baptized in the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus, God, I pray they would do that tonight, today, God. Lord, I pray, God, we'd be filled with your spirit, God, filled with passion, God. Lord, I pray there would be hidden manna, Lord, in this place, God. Lord, I pray in 2022, God, give us revelation, God, like we've never had before. God, I pray spiritual growth like we've never had before, God. I pray we'd be hungry for you, God. Lord, rid us, God, of the love of the world, God. Rid us, God, of materialism. God, rid us, God, of lust. God, rid us, oh God, Lord, of, of being entertained, God, by things and looking to things that can never make us happy. Lord, and help us to realize, God, we can only be happy in your presence. If you want more of Jesus today, the altar's open. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit today, the altar's open. If you need a miracle today, there's hidden manna today in this place. There's God has something for somebody today. Maybe you came in here today with low expectations and just another Sunday. I want to tell you, it's not just another Sunday. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is in this place. on the goodness yes. of God. I don't want to keep up with the Kardashians. I want to keep up with Jesus. How many knows that the happiest moments is you're going to feel right here. You're going to feel in the presence of God, the goodness of God. This is where God fills most of us. This is where God baptized most of us. This is the place where our lives would change. And so I, I just want to, you to think about what God has done for you. And I want us to praise him for it. Let's lift up our hands. Come on, let's sing it.